Heavenly Rejoicing over Babylon Revelation 18.20-19.4 through 19, 4. Rejoice over her, O heaven, even all the saints and the apostles and the prophets, because God has exacted from her the retribution due you. And a powerful angel lifted up something resembling a huge stone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus in the blink of an eye shall Babylon the great city be thrown down, and never again will there be heard in her the sound of harpists or musicians or flute players or trumpets, and never again will there be found in you any of your skilled technicians, and never again will there be seen in you the light of your lamps, and never again will there be heard in you the joyous sound of bridegroom and bride. For those who did business with you were the great men of the earth, doing so because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all those slain upon the earth. After these things I heard something like the sound of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who was corrupting the earth with her prostitution, and he has exacted retribution from her hand for the blood of his servants. And they spoke a second time, Hallelujah! And her smoke is rising up forever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sits upon the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah! Revelation 18.20-19.4 through 19, 4. The laments for Babylon's destruction coming from the merchants of the world and based upon earthly materialistic concerns is answered in these verses by heavenly songs of victory which put Babylon's annihilation into its proper divine perspective. No matter what the world may think, the obliteration of Babylon is a decidedly good thing from the only point of view that really counts, God's point of view, for she is inherently evil. In the process of underlining the permanence of the chilling judgment upon Babylon, we are given here the second divine reason for her destruction. As we saw in verse 3 of chapter 18, the first divine reason concerned the corrupting influence Babylon had exercised upon the world, primarily upon unbelievers, in promoting, supporting, and in fact to a very great degree, producing the system of spiritual prostitution exploited by Antichrist. After reaffirming this first basis for her judgment in Revelation 19.2, for he has judged the great prostitute who was corrupting the earth with her prostitution, the great heavenly multitude whom John hears provide him with the second indictment, which has provided grounds for her obliteration, he has exacted retribution from her hand for the blood of his servants. Thus Babylon's pivotal role in Antichrist's attempt to expunge all believers in Jesus Christ from the earth during the great persecution is the behavior which has sealed her fate. For not only did she support the devil and the beast in their intensified corruption of the world, but she also opposed God in the most hubristic way by making possible the near eradication of believers from the earth. The precise manner of her involvement in this regard, as was suggested in the last installment of this series, are Babylon's commercial, political, military, technological and religious dominance, all of which will have been brought to bear in the effort of Satan and his Antichrist to destroy believers worldwide, Revelation 17.6. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the world, and I saw that the woman was drunk from the blood of the saints, even from the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation 17, 5 and 6 The voice of the refugees and fugitives from the land of Babylon resounds to tell in Zion, that is Jerusalem, of the vengeance of the Lord our God, vengeance for his temple, that is believers. Jeremiah 50, 28 Jeremiah said to Sariah, when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud. Then say, O Lord, you have said you will destroy this place so that neither man nor animal will live in it. It will be desolate forever. When you finish reading this scroll, tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates. Then say, So will Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster I will bring upon her. And her people will fall. Jeremiah 51, 61 through 64 this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. 
So I took the cup from the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it, Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a ruin and an object of horror and scorn and cursing, as they are today. Pharaoh king of Egypt, his attendants, his officials, and all his people, and all the foreign people there, all the kings of Uz, all the kings of the Philistines, those of Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the people left at Ashdod, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, all the kings of Tyre and Sidon, the kings of the coastlands across the sea, Dedan, Tima, Buzz, and all who are in distant places, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the foreign people who live in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, Elam, and Media, and all the kings of the north near and far one after the other, all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. And after all of them, the king of Sheshach, that is Babylon, will drink it too. Jeremiah 25, 15 through 26. The Beast's Armageddon Crusade. Following the destruction of Babylon, the narrative in Revelation moves swiftly to the tribulation's end, and the first indication we receive that the battle of Armageddon is about to take place comes later on in chapter 19, in the description of the rider on the white horse in verse 11 and following. But we are given no further information in this passage about the activities of the beast in assembling the armies of the world to Israel with the purpose of destroying her and opposing the return of the king. The reason for this rapid conclusion to the narrative of tribulational events is no doubt twofold. 1. From this point forward, the Messiah and his victorious return in company with his newly resurrected bride, the Church, form the true and proper focus of all that remains to tell next in Revelation and 2. We are already in possession of the details of Antichrist's Armageddon Crusade, which is sufficiently described elsewhere in Scripture. Therefore, before moving on in Revelation proper, whose next descriptions in 19.5 and following deal exclusively with events on the threshold of the Second Advent, followed immediately by the Second Advent itself, it will be helpful first to pull together here the biblical testimony about the intervening events, that is, the Scriptures, which deal with Antichrist's mustering of all of the armed forces of the world to invade and destroy Israel and to oppose Jesus Christ upon his return. With the North back under his control, with all restraint removed for the assembly of the kings of the East, with Babylon now out of the way, and with the forces employed in her destruction now available, the beast's mustering of the armies of the world for the assault upon Israel will begin in earnest. Throughout his rule and visible in his opposition to all truth, Antichrist has continually represented the lie as the truth and evil as good. This trend will reach its apex now at the end of the Great Tribulation in the Battle of Armageddon, where our returning Lord will be represented by the beast as the usurper who must be opposed at all costs. We may expect the beast to build this final crusade as being one of so-called good against so-called evil, Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 16, 12 through 16, casting the Jewish people in the role of the last stain, which must be erased in order to gain the final victory. Moreover, once Israel is destroyed, there will be no one left to deliver. Thus Antichrist's gathering of the nations to Jerusalem to exterminate Israel will seem to him and his father the devil the ideal way to put the Lord on the spot, daring him to prevent the elimination of the Jewish state and the Jewish race. Since he is the pseudo-Messiah, it had no doubt been a sweet thing for the beast prior to this Jewish rebellion to have his military headquarters at Jerusalem, the prophesied millennial capital. For the past several years, Jerusalem was the capital of death where many were forced to come to worship Antichrist on pain of execution, but Jerusalem is also the coming capital of life, where all will desire to come and appear before the true Messiah, Zechariah 8.23. That coming wave of visitation will be in response to the divine millennial blessings about to be poured out upon the entire earth. At present, however, we see the earth reeling under the bold judgments of which Armageddon is the final travail. The unbelieving world led by Antichrist is responding to these just judgments from the Lord exactly as Pharaoh had done, by attacking God's people rather than learning from their mistakes. Instead of repentance, the proper response in the face of such clear divine disapproval, the world as a whole is only too happy to join in the madness of the beast's crusade, 
in an attempt to fight against God himself.